Hi everyone, my name is Brandon Zarnath. I am currently a prelim uh, internal medicine resident at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, New York, and then doing my advanced program in diagnostic radiology at SUNY Upstate University Medical Center. Tutor experience two years as of this June. Uh, I am the lead tutor for topmbtutors.com and also the vice president. My board examination scores, USM sub one of 240, USM or the CCSE comprehensive MBME exam of 260, USM step 2 CK score of 262, and USM step 3 score is pending as of last week. And I wanted to go over an example of kind of what our program looks like. And so for the first example today, we'll go through here. 25-year-old patient with features of either vitiligo or Hashimoto's or type 1 diabetes, all autoimmune diseases. Right? It's presenting with a four-month history of loose stools, abdominal bloating, and overall failure to thrive. The patient describes the diarrhea as greasy, awful smelling, and difficult to flush. During this time, the patient has also noticed an unintentional weight loss of 12 pounds. Exam shows pale conjunctiva. A CBC report shows an MCV of 65 with a hemoglobin of 10.8 and a peripheral blood smear with hyperchromic red blood cells. Now, the likely diagnosis, even though we don't know what it is yet, right, is celiac disease. Not lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance would not have failed to thrive in weight loss. More abdominal bloating and associated dairy products. Now, if you suspect this condition, you know, what should you order next in the workup? EGD of biopsy, or should you measure the IgA tissue transglutaminase antibodies, aka serology? Right? And in this situation, you start off with serology, the tissue transglutaminase antibodies. Now, why might these antibodies be negative despite the patient having every single feature of celiac disease? And that's because of the high prevalence, right, with concurrent selective IgA deficiency in these patients. And so what antibody would you measure in this situation? the IgG deaminated gliadin peptides. And also keep in mind that both the titers of the tissue transglutaminase antibodies, IgA, and the IgG deaminated gliadin peptides, the titers of these patients will decrease if they, if they adhere to a strict gluten-free diet. So that's how you can monitor adherence. Now, to confirm the diagnosis, that's when you would do the EGD with biopsy, right, of the small intestine. And what you look for is this from Google Images here. All right, so you can see how you have nice tall villi here, but then you get blunting, flattening of the villi here. Here. All right, and so what you'll find, the findings are crypt hyperplasia, or you also see villus atrophy that we just saw there in the picture on the histology, and intraepithelial lymphocytic infiltration. The villus atrophy, hence the malabsorption of iron that we'll talk about soon. Now, what are celiac disease patients at risk for with future blood transfusions? Say their hemoglobin is less than seven in the hospital, they need a blood transfusion. Remember the anaphylactic reaction secondary to the IgE antibodies against IgA because their body doesn't have IgA and they form antibodies against it. Now, if you want to prevent this, should we wash the blood or do leukoreduction? reduction? Right. We want to wash the blood. Leukoreduction reduction is to prevent febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction, like the fever, tachycardia within six hours of blood transfusion. No evidence of hemolysis on labs. Leukoreduction reduction is also to help prevent the transmission of CMV. Here. Right. Now, when you're looking at the MCV on the CBC report up here, it was less than 80, and their hemoglobin is low and they're hypochromic red blood cells. So why the low MCV in patients with celiac disease? And we mentioned it briefly, but here it's because of the iron ferrous malabsorption in the distal duodenum that we saw in histology that gets damaged with the blunting. How flat these are here, can't absorb iron then, iron deficiency anemia. And now a good tie-in, so the next best step when you suspect iron deficiency anemia, Right, you got to get iron studies. And what you're going to be looking for is iron is going to be low, right? Ferritin, the storage form is going to be low. TIBC, which is always the opposite of ferritin, is going to be high. And then your transferrin saturation, transferrin saturation is also going to be low. Here. Now, with the statorrhea that these patients have in the vignette and the failure to thrive, what vitamins do you expect them to be deficient in? Right, remember the fat soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, also B12, keep in mind too. 
And so how we can tie that in is, you know, an example like this, 25 year old with celiac disease, signs and symptoms, presenting with bone pains over the shins, bilaterally muscle aches. Labs on the BMP study show a phos- with the phosphate added, because it doesn't come with that, shows low calcium, low phosphate. And a 25 year old, well, this is likely osteomalacia, right? Secondary to the vitamin D deficiency right here that it's associated with celiac disease. All right, the vitamin deficient, vitamin deficient that we want to screen for. Is it the 25 hydroxy vitamin D2 calcidiol or is it the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3 calcitriol? Yes, this is the active form that absorbs the, the calcium and phosphate in your body, but the storage form is actually the calcidiol, is what you would measure for iron deficient or for vitamin D deficiency. So etiology, right? Vitamin D deficiency. Here. All right. Perfect. Now. Now, similar situation, 25-year-old with celiac disease, why might you see a leukocyte count of 3,500 leukopenia? Because normal is about 5 to 10,000 on a CBC. And this is simply due to vitamin deficiency. Right. Specifically, you're thinking B12. And remember, without B12, you can't support DNA synthesis of new cells from the step one knowledge. Now, what skin finding is associated with celiac disease with patches of grouped itchy blisters on like the posterior aspects of your elbows. Remember that is dermatitis or pediformis. Etiology, you get these IgA and C3 deposits in the dermal papilla. Now the treatment, it depends. Is it acute treatment that you're worried about or is it more so long-term? So acute treatment, you can give Dapsone, the drug Dapsone. But remember, be careful in patients with G6PD deficiency because it can precipitate hemolysis. Now they're fatigued, short of breath, um, and their LDH is high, their haptoglobin's low. Long-term, gluten-free diet right, to prevent it. Now, treatment for celiac disease overall, right, for celiac disease overall, is, again, lifelong gluten-free diets, excluding wheat and barley. Now, why might the TSH levels be high in these patients? Remember, we talked about earlier here, right? It's associated with other CX disease and autoimmune disease, and it's associated with other autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's. And that's why the TSH levels might be high, greater than five, typically. 0.5 to five is normal, so greater than five. Right. And another name for Hashimoto's, in case that's not listed ever, remember, is also called chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. It is the number one cause of hypothyroidism in the U.S. Labs that you'll find, high TSH, low free T4. Now, the difference between overt hypothyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism will be a discussion for the future. So I hope you enjoyed this session. These are what our sessions look like at Top MD Tutors. See you next time.